Capetonians always know how to make Josie people feel welcome, so thank you so much. Um, I'm going to kick off and just say, first of all, thanks to Caddo for giving me this opportunity to talk about this phenomenal new technology um, that is genome engineering. It's, it's making waves, not only globally, but there are scientists here in South Africa who are adopting the technique. Um, and so whether that's in the form of therapy or the way that we use it as a molecular tool, I think it's going to really change the way we can uh, try and address some of the health issues in, in South Africa. I'm going to start talking about the hope. This is Layla. This pic was taken uh, towards the end of last year. She was a year old. She'd been diagnosed with an incurable type of leukemia. And the doctors and her family had really come to the end of thinking of what options they could do. But one of the members of the clinical team recalled that there was a small vial of frozen T cells in a freezer at Great Ormond Street that a French company, Selectus, had engineered. The surface of these cells contain a little receptor called a chimeric antigen receptor for T cells. It's called CART. These are designed very carefully because if you put these T cells into a person who has cancer, that, that little mark will direct those cells towards the cancer cells and attack them. But the problem was is that they weren't her T cells. They weren't a match. So you can't put those into a one-year-old with leukemia, or well, for anyone for that matter, because of graft versus host disease. So they had to grow the cells back up and re-engineer them to remove the gene that was responsible for recognition. And once they'd done that, they injected them into her, and she's now alive and doing incredibly well. So for me, this is perhaps the most extraordinary example I could think of to demonstrate how phenomenal genome engineering is. So what I'd like to do now, though, is just take you through some of the other applications that we can um, do with genome engineering. But before I do that, I have to take you back to the basics. So forgive me. <laughs> this is the central dogma of biology. And I think most of you are going to be familiar with the idea that any double-stranded DNA that you have, it is the code, it's the blueprint. And whatever sequence is there dictates the proteins that you make, okay? It's really that simple. If there are any changes in that DNA sequence, if it's in an important part of the coding region, it will change what that protein does. And if it's in a really important part, it's going to knock it out completely and you won't have any protein formed. So bearing that in mind that that sequence is so important, and if you even change one or two small nucleotides, that can have a massive effect. Let's then talk about how genome engineering works. All of the genome engineering scissors, enzymes, I'm going to call them nucleases because that's what they are, but imagine them as molecular scissors, do one simple thing. They create a massive double-strand break in your DNA helix, okay? And that is the worst thing that you can do to a cell. It completely freaks out. And it's got one of two options in the way that it has to repair it, and it has to repair it fast. The one way that it can do it is by sending in the cellular machinery there as quickly as it, as it can to try and bring back together, that's, imagine like a tethered, frayed rope. So you're trying to rejoin those pieces together as quickly as you can. But what tends to happen, the cell makes mistakes. It doesn't seal that bridge together perfectly. So you can have one or two nucleotides that have been added, one or two that have been removed. Now, if you can imagine if those nucleotides are in a part of the genome that code for something important, You've changed it, sometimes quite deleteriously, but sometimes to the advantage, because this is what they did for Layla with those particular T cells. They were able to shut down the gene that would create that graft versus host problem. So that's one method that you can do, but it's kind of like a shotgun approach and you're hoping for results. The other option is to guide the DNA, to guide the repair. So you still create that double strand break but this time, you give it a piece of sequence, the sequence you've designed, and you say, when you do the repair, add this, specifically this and only this. So you can imagine that you could change a mutation, just one single base pair, you could correct that, or you could add in an entire gene. By and large, though there are some technical challenges with larger pieces of DNA, there are no limitations to what you can change the DNA into. And this is the power of genome engineering. I think a lot of you will be familiar with the idea of gene therapy. That's a, a phrase that's been um, uh, bounced around um, in, in medicine for, for decades now. And it's important to understand the distinction between gene therapy and genome engineering. Whilst genome engineering is a, can be a type of gene therapy, 
the traditional methods that we had for gene therapy meant that we could still add a piece of DNA to a cell, but we didn't know where we were putting it, okay? It's a little about sending in a Land Rover without GPS signal. So you've got no way to guide it to the place that it needs to go. It might be taking in the important piece of information, but you could have multiple copies, and it could be inserting itself into oncogenes, for example, and leading to cancer. So the differences with genome engineering is that these nucleases create a break exactly where you want it to be, and only in that particular position. And that's what makes it so powerful. For those of you who are reading up on these kinds of things, you'll hear names, some of the nucleases, some are called zinc finger nucleases, some are called tailins, but the new kid on the block is CRISPR. So this is the CRISPR, Cas9 is the nuclease. I don't want you to worry too much about the details of this. Suffice to say that if you can imagine your stretch of genomic DNA being like this, what the CRISPR does is that it only, all you have to do is give it 20 nucleotides of sequence to direct it to the piece of DNA that it's going to. So as opposed to the other nucleases that we had that are incredibly complex and technologically difficult to make and take months to create, this can take two days. All you have to do is order 20 nucleotides of DNA and you can dictate where it's gonna go. It is this ease of use and accessibility to just about anyone with some fairly basic molecular biology skills that means that anyone could be doing any kind of editing in any environment. Let's talk about the logistics, okay? Now that you understand the basics. There are two ways in which we can use genome engineering for therapeutic purposes. This is the first one. So very simply, you could design your CRISPR or the other nucleases that you have, and you've specifically designed it to target one particular piece of DNA, and you can encapsulate it in some delivery vehicles, and then use those and inject that into the body. We call that in vivo editing. The second method is what we refer to as ex vivo editing. Now this is a little bit more technically challenging, but does offer one major advantage. What we can do now, are take cells out of a person who has one particular disease caused by a genetic mutation, for example, take them out, grow them up in a dish in the lab, use genome engineering to correct the mutation, and then select only the cells that have been corrected and put them back in. Now you can imagine immediately that the advantage with this is that you're getting almost 100% correction in the area that you need to go into. And this is an, a strategy that a lot of people are using at the moment for different disease applications. But there is one little problem for, with this, is that by and large, the cell type that you take out, let's say it's a liver cell, is the cell type you can correct and the cell type you can put back in. But for a lot of diseases, the genetic mutation causes problems all over the body. So you imagine you'd have to start taking out heart cells and taking out blood cells and taking out liver cells and correcting all of those and trying to find ways of putting them back. So there is a caveat to this ex vivo approach. And that is this. You can take a very small skin biopsy, grow those skin cells up in a dish, we call them fibroblasts, and a guy called Shinya Yamanaka, who won the Nobel Prize for this in 2012, realized that he could convince those skin cells to become induced pluripotent stem cells. And what that means is that once you've got those, you can turn them into any cell type that you want blood, brain cells, liver, heart, anything. Now all you have to do is correct the one original stem cell group here, and you can make a whole range of cell types that have been corrected to go back into the body. And I really think that what's gonna happen with genome engineering is that it's gonna coalesce really beautifully with this type of technology and create a lot of options for us from a therapeutic point of view. So let's talk about what's been done so far. I wanna talk to you about the HIV work, but in order to do that, I need to talk to you for a few minutes about a gene called CCR5 and touch on the plague. In the early days of HIV research, they realized that there were a number of individuals who had been infected with HIV, but for years and years and years weren't showing any symptoms. They called them elite controllers. And after an extensive amount of research, they realized that they actually had a, a defunct CCR5 gene. They've got a mutation in CCR5. And CCR5 is important, so I'm not gonna go into the details of HIV infection, but it's absolutely essential for the virus to get into your blood cells. So if you don't have a good copy of it, the virus can't get in. And it turns out that the reason why some subpopulations actually have 
not an insignificant proportion of these CCR5 deletions is that it also conferred a selective advantage during the plague hundreds and hundreds of years ago. And then in 2008, during some remarkable medicine, a group of scientists in Germany tried an approach where, for a number of reasons, this particular patient, the Berlin patient, also known as Tim Brown, um, who was HIV positive, for a number of clinical reasons, they had to remove, for all intents and purposes, his bone marrow. And they needed to then replace it with an immune matched set. But instead of just choosing a ra just any immune match, they chose one from someone who naturally had the CCR5 mutation. And they put the, this bone marrow back into him, and he had two sets of those treatments. And to this day, he is the only person who has a sterilized cure of HIV. They haven't been able to detect any more HIV in his body. And he went off antiretrovirals during the first treatment. So what does this mean for genome engineering? Well, if natural mutations can make you resistant to HIV, then let's just make them with genome engineering. It's not that hard. And so as a result of that, that is where the um, most advanced trials of genome engineering are at this particular point. Sangamo is running a phase two in the US. Um, there are a number of other drug companies that are doing a few. And we're obviously waiting with bated breath to see how those go, but it's very, very exciting. We're gonna to touch on how we can use genome engineering as a molecular tool, because this is really the area that, that the lab that I work in focuses on, and, and, and it's the, really the area that I'm passionate about. There are so many ways in which CRISPR, in particular, has been used as a molecular tool. I chose one because it's, again, something that we're working on, but there are diverse methods that you could use. I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about creating isogenic cells and why that's important. I mentioned to you that you can make induced pluripotent stem cells from any individual just by taking a skin sample. Now, once you grow those stem cells up, you can turn them into any cell type, and I'll show you a few examples in a sec. But what you might want to do with that is turn them into heart cells or liver cells to do drug toxicity tests. That's important because a lot of the drugs that are developed to date, by and large, are tested in the US and in Europe. So you're testing those drugs on Caucasian individuals. It's not helpful when you send them down to sub-Saharan Africa, which contains the greatest genetic diversity of the world, and included in that, mutations in their, for example, some of the genes that are responsible for drug metabolism, which then leads to very severe adverse drug reactions. So what we're trying to do is reassess those drugs, but shorten the pipeline. We, want to, we don't want to redo the clinical trials completely. So what we've been using genome editing for is to identify those mutations that different people across the population have in genes that are responsible for drug metabolism, for example, and edit them and put them into stem cells. And each line that you create, you create another mutation and you create another one. Now, we call them isogenic because you could have a number of these cell lines and the only difference between any one of them, the only genetic difference, is the mutation that you've added. So now when you're testing drugs in those particular cells, you can tell which mutation is causing which adverse drug reaction. It's an incredibly powerful method. Obviously, it's important to be able to take those particular stem cells and turn them into something rad. So some of the things that we've been working on and made in the lab are these little white blood cells, also called macrophages. You can see the little pseudopods squiggling around here. They're terribly sweet to watch in the dish. And we've also made um, cardiomyocytes beating heart cells, essentially, which you can see beat synchronously in this particular example. So it's a very powerful strategy to combine induced pluripotent stem cell technology with genome engineering. I mentioned to you that, particularly as a result of CRISPR, it really has created a huge amount of debate in the public and scientific arena. And I imagine if I was in the public and not as particularly well informed as we are in science, that there would be some concerns. Because you can imagine some of us rogue scientists sitting there with dodgy white coats and creating designer babies and God knows what else. But it's not an invalid concern. And so what I wanna do is just take you through a few of the events over the last 18 months that have made this come through to the public and just reassure you to some degree, but also may, um, inform you, hopefully. Early last year, 
scientists, Nobel laureates, and co-discoverers of CRISPR alike were getting a little bit worried because rumors had circulating rather that research groups were trying to use CRISPR to edit human embryos. And they weren't wrong. A group published this at the end of March last year where they used genome engineering to modify human embryos. I want to just point to the phrase that they used here, tripronuclear zygotes, and just for a moment, the way that they felt that these scientists felt that they had bypassed the ethical dilemmas of doing this in embryos is that these particular embryos would have been discarded by the IVF clinic. They're not sustainable um, for life. Obviously, that created a bit of a scruck for everybody, and so all of the scientists got together, and they... And usually for scientists, because we don't like being restrained <laughs> at all, they, they asked for a moratorium on this work until such time as we'd all gotten together and discussed it. And they did, towards the end of last year. For three days, scientists from all over the world got together to talk about what the regulations on this type of engineering should be. And it was interesting because we were hoping for something rather definitive, and it really wasn't, but there might be a good reason for that. But what they ended up saying was, look, for the type of work that I was talking about, using it as a molecular tool, taking cells out of patients, correcting them, putting them back in, by and large, most people are very comfortable with that. It's the editing in embryos that really um, makes people uncomfortable. So they didn't ban it outright, but they said that on a case-by-case -case basis, if someone had to motivate for it, they had to motivate so strongly that this would benefit something from a health perspective in the long term and be heavily regulated. And incidentally, at the beginning of this year, a UK group of scientists were granted permission, the first level of permission, to modify human embryos when investigating infertility issues. So the last slide I'm gonna show you just sums up that sort of regulatory landscape that exists around the world. And what you can see straight away is that it's not in any way uniform. In some cases, like the States, for example, there's no ban on clinical applications of genome engineering in human embryos, but you do have to apply and you can't use federal funds. Whereas in the UK, you're not allowed to edit for clinical purposes in human embryos, but you can do it for research applications, which is interesting. I think what concerns me the most, and I'm going to finish with this, is this little orangey color down here. And we are described at best as ambiguous. But I don't actually think that we, it necessarily has to be a bad thing. I think that given the fact that we don't even have any legislation at all that addresses this in any way, it puts us in a better position because we don't have to change what was written before. We're actually in a position of putting together the most well-informed, the best regulations that have had serious discussion between the public and scientists alike. Because what we really want ultimately is for scientists to be enabled to do some really rad science with this tool, but make sure at the same time that the public's mind is at ease. So I'm gonna end with that and acknowledge our funders, the Department of Science and Technology, and um, this is our lab, that's my boss. <laughs> um, and I'll finish there.